So before we begin today, I'd like to talk about ants. And then when I say ants, you might be wondering, okay, they said this would be about artificial intelligence. Why is he going on about ants? We determine ants to be pests, and then we shoo them out. We call for pest control, we stamp them, and then we kill them. But within the ant population, there's a huge variety. There's like this very caste system-like thing within the ant population. So there are classes of ants. Each ant is responsible for one job. So it's like you have worker ants that collect food. You have uh, weaver ants that weave nests out of leaves. The colony that we live in, society, it's not that different either. Okay. So each human has his own role. You know, we have, we too have uh, carpenters, weavers, farmers, and what have you. So here's a snake. Now, what if the snake comes into the colony one day and consumes all the worker ants? Okay, all the worker ants. So normally, what would happen? So in the case of humanity, if all the farmers died, most of us would go and you know try learn to farm. It's been taught to us in uh, you know our uh, first grade, second grade, third grade, environmental sciences everywhere. It's been covered. So we probably know how to grow a few things. We know pro how to cook. But that's not the case with ants. Ants cannot suddenly pick up tasks like we humans can. Okay. So why is it? What happens within the ant population is if uh, an entire class of you know worker ants dies, the colony cannot collect food anymore because they have to wait an entire generation. Okay, an entire generation of worker ants has to be born again for any food collection to take place. There's no restaffing of any sort. So why are we humans capable of you know picking up uh, active what do you say skills within our lifetime? So here's some here's our brain. And it's fascinated many people, poets, scientists, researchers, all of them. What's special about human brains and mammal brains to a larger degree is that we have something called the neocortex. It's a special cerebral cortex that allows us to make and break habits within a lifetime. Now, over the last uh, you know, course of human history, the last 50 years, which have been the most productive years in our time, we've come up with a lot of math, a lot of science. Okay, so when you think of math, we using this math, we have come up with a lot of tools that help us, you know, accomplish tasks. So the stage was probably built using, you know, a lot of geometry and stuff, so that it doesn't collapse suddenly as I walk around. Okay, think of it. Everything around you is patterns. Everything somehow is a product of math and science. Then, as a process of making these tools, we have come up with something called artificial intelligence, something that was only theorized for a very long time until now. And since computational power has reached the peak. As of now, we're able to build and deploy them. That is to bring it as consumer applications to you. Now, artificial intelligence, when I say it, it's like uh, not everyone gets it. But you've probably had experiences with it. Take, for example, Cortana or Siri on your iPhone, anything, Google Assistant. All of them are powered by artificial intelligence. I'll give you a few examples. So it's like, just think of it. Uh, Google's campus in Mountain View, California, if you were to go there and sit today, OK? you would see one of these things driving around. Any guesses what this is? This is what we call a self-driving car. If you notice, there's nobody in the cockpit, and there's no remote control operation happening either. So when I say artificial intelligence, then it's not always about you know this big, giant hunk of metal that's here to kill you and then subjugate all of you. Sometimes it could be a small hunk of plastic you know, playing a pet, like this one here. This is Sony's Aibo, a product that is very mainstream in Japan. See, now you see a robotic dog, and then you'll be like, oh wait, so it's here to replace my dog one day. So he's saying dogs are not perfect. We'll have machines one day that'll be much more perfect than dogs. See, that's not the case. This is not a product meant to replace dogs. It's meant to replace dogs in very, very specific niche areas. So it's like, take for example your grandparents, okay? Most of the time, unless you have cousins who are very young who stay with your grandparents, your grandparents are mostly lonely. And if you were to go give them a pet, you know, so that they can have the compassion of a, that a dog has to offer, they probably can't take care of it, can't take it on walks, can't feed it on time. What if the dog falls sick? They can't take care of it. But this robot won't grow tired. It, all it needs is a USB connector somewhere in your house, and it's fine. It'll keep on playing. See, this isn't a way of replacing dogs, replacing anyone, per se. Okay? Now, that example aside, if you're like me, and you're very bad with faces, okay, so it's like you've met that person twice in your life, and you have to recognize them immediately. And then now, instead of awkwardly going through the crowd and fishing for his name, like, hey, please, can you tell me his name? What's his name? That guy in the white shirt, what's his name? Instead of going around fishing, someday you'll probably have wearable technology that you can just you know, plug onto your glasses, and you can be like, okay, what's this guy's name again, Siri? 
and it'll be like, yeah, this person is so-and-so, and here's his Facebook and Instagram profiles in case you want to stalk this person. So for someone like Superman, that is bad news. This is the future of facial recognition. This is probably how Facebook is going to be in a couple of years. You know, it'll be, it'll be an app that'll be running on your glasses itself. Now, when I say artificial intelligence, we've seen a lot of potential in these few examples alone. The world's going to change dramatically when artificial intelligence becomes mainstream. It's already becoming mainstream. Now, when I say artificial intelligence, there's a lot of pro pros and cons. Like everything in life, AI too has its own pros and cons. Now, the immediate thing when I say AI, everybody is reminded of the Terminator movies. You know, those huge number of prequels and sequels. It's not really like uh, one day they'll come take over the entire planet. You know, at this point, you're, everybody starts fearing. You know, they'll have these fears of the unknown. It's like, what if someday AI will be to us what we've been to the rest of the species on this planet? We don't treat, uh, do we treat the other species on this planet kindly? Do we? No. So we'll have these fears. Okay, if there's a superior one, the dominant one, that'll be AI in this case, it'll probably blow us all up and that'll be the end of humanity. But think of it, haven't we already done all of this to a great degree? Haven't we blown up ecosystems overnight? Haven't we wrecked havoc already? So then let's think of artificial intelligence and try to break it down and see why this is not a huge deal and look at the math side, look at the definitions. So mathematically speaking, the guys who theorized machine learning or artificial intelligence termed it as an optimization process, wherein given a problem, okay, like you know, recognizing a face or going through a straight road without crashing into something, and given the parameters, that is don't crash into the side lanes, don't run into other cars, you're going straight, but don't run into other cars, please. These are the parameters. You have to optimize for the best result and complete the task. So take, for example, all the planes that, that are flying around. And suddenly I decide I'll go from New York to Hawaii, OK? I have a trip. As soon as I sit down on a tra travel website, you'll have like thousands of options for thousands of planes at different price points, going through different routes, each with, uh, with its own boarding time, get off time, and all of that. Now then, how do you decide? You'll have to probably take a notepad and start writing down and then compare. Now, at this point, you'll have something like artificial intelligence. This is where the magic of artificial intelligence becomes useful to you. We have apps which are like, OK, these are all the planes that are available. OK, I'll optimize, optimize, I'll find the best plane. So it's like least amount of time for the least amount of price. You know, it'll find that sweet spot on the graph and tell you this is the uh, plane that you're supposed to take. OK, that is fine. Uh, I could probably spend a few hours and do it myself. Why do I have to rely on a machine? I'm smart enough to do that, if you say that. Now, what if I uh, make it more complex and your friend is like, your co-passenger is like, OK, we'll get down in Mexico and we'll grab some tacos. So now this is another parameter in the question itself. Now, this would be tougher for you to think for, as you have to think of a plane that will you know, be available at the right time when you get off and you know, have, grab your tacos. So this is something where machine learning is more useful for. So now here come the fears. It's like, OK, it can learn a lot of things. Now, what if? Uh, you said that it will optimize for the best possible solution. So what if you, uh, you'll ask me, they, OK, so Shrit, what if we task AI with ending all war? What do you think would happen? Just think for a second. What do you think would AI do if it has to optimize for the best possible solution, if it, uh, if it is tasked with the you know, agenda of ending all war? Now, if you ask me, I would say, if you ask most of the people around, probably you might yourself have thought of this, it's like, yeah, it's going to end all humanity because it'll probably determine at some time that as long as humans exist, there will be wars. Okay, and uh, if there are no humans, there'll be no wars. Best solution, right? So here's the thing. See, okay, that, that is a possible theory, and that is what has allowed uh, movies like Terminator to exist. That's what has let uh, Hollywood make so much money. See, all that aside, anybody, let me tell you, anybody, as a person who's worked on algorithms that are capable of learning, see, anybody who's of understanding the math and science behind machine learning would not immediately arm the AI with nuclear launch codes. It's like, okay, you're self-aware, okay, I'll give you uh, nuclear launch codes, do whatever you want. We don't do that. See, what we use artificial intelligence for is like, we try to solve the complex problems that our world is facing today. You know, take for example, overpopulation. Uh, take for example, poverty or disease or any of those. All these problems, they're tested in controlled environments. So it's like within a game where you have people, you'll release the AI as another person, and you'll see what the AI is doing. If it is feasible, if it is not dangerous, we'll apply it to the real world. A lot of these practices keep on going. Take, for example, IBM's Watson. What it has done over time is it has collected data about patients, and when a new patient uh, reports to the doctor, 
it generates uh, statistics, it will generate diets, it will generate good medicines that are compatible with the ta patient's medical history. So there's no complications. It does not replace a doctor, it will advise the doctor, so it saves the time for the doctor. So it's simple diseases like fever, you know, cold, cough, all of these are solved immediately. So the doctor can focus on the more complex cases. The, the machine does not pull the person to the operation theater and immediately, you know, uh, make him undergo chemotherapy and cure his cancer. That's not the case. Now, when it comes to automation, we've seen a lot of jobs have been lost. Okay, this is one, one another argument. AI will take over all the jobs, you know, it's like, whatever I can learn, you say machines can learn it too. And uh, since they keep getting better and better, we humans don't get uh, upgrade packages every year, which allow us to be 10% more faster than last year. This piece of metal here is called IBM's Deep Blue. In 1997, it was pit against Gary Kasparov, the then uh, chess grandmaster, okay? The claim that Deep Blue had was that it was the best chess player around and it could beat anyone, okay? So nobody expected it to win because how can a machine be better than a human? So to everyone's surprise, Gary Kasparov lost, okay? Now here's how uh, Google's, I mean, uh, IBM's uh, Deep Blue worked. What it did was it took every possible move. Say I played a move, okay, it'll see that move and calculate all the possible moves in existence that can happen after it. Then choose the best move. Now when you think of it, it's like you have a dictionary uh, kind of thing which has all the moves in chess. I'll immediately search for the move that you played and I'll choose the best move. Sounds like cheating, doesn't it? That is basically cheating. There's no intelligence involved. It's only a very good calculator, okay? Now, uh, 20 years later, a company that was acquired by Google called DeepMind came up with this al algorithm called AlphaGo. This was optimized for a game called Go. It's a game, it's a board game, just like chess, but very, very different. I'll get into that very soon. So what happened was it was pit against, you know, the grandmaster uh, level person called Lee Sedol, and to everyone's surprise, again, Lee Sedol lost as well. So here's the difference between Go and chess as a game, and here's the proof that Go wasn't brute forced just like chess. If you were to brute force all the possible moves within a chess game, a game of chess would have a total of 10 to the power 120 unique games, whereas a game of Go would have 10 to the power 7, 61 possible games. Now, if you want to wrap your mind around that uh, number, here's a comparison. The universe as we know it has 10 to the power 80 atoms. Just think of the sheer magnitude of that number. We have no technology today that is capable of processing so much numbers, so, so, so many calculations. So imagine a game of soccer tomorrow, it's like uh, Real Madrid versus Barcelona. And all you have are machines playing. Okay, yeah, sure, that, there'll be like incredible shots, no failed passes, no red cards, no yellow cards, no fouls no penalty shootouts, nothing like that. You'll have amazing shots, amazing team coordination. But that's about it. There's no more unique things to it. Uh, why? Okay, because these machines are perfect. Everything they do is perfect. So why do we love sports? Just think about it. Why do you lo love a particular sport? It's because a player that you like, he has a few flaws. You know, you know it very well. This guy is not good at this position. He's not a good goalkeeper, but he's a very good forward guy. He's, not, he's a bad defender, but he's good at midfielding. Something like that. Each person has his own traits. Seeing them work with the team and cover for those flaws and then grow as a person, this is what connects us to them. You cannot relate yourself to a robot. It's not like, oh, I can perform these calculations at the same speed as this machine. There's no comparison you'll draw with a machine and sympathize with it, okay? So this is where I feel, you know, without the emotion that we humans have and the flaws that we humans have, these flaws are the changing factor. These flaws are what allow us to relate to a human. This is what makes uh, sports irreplaceable for human players. Let's move on. Okay, professional uh, tiers aside, you know, you've spoken about just grandmasters and soccer players. What about average people? You're talking about uh, self-driving cars. What about uh, people who are uh, cab drivers who are losing their jobs to self-driving cars? Here's the thing, right? When you think about self-driving cars, they're not meant to replace all cab drivers. They're meant to be used in places where humans are no longer able to drive safely. Think of it this way. Think of all the truckers who drive late in the night in poorly maintained roads. What about them? What about uh, firefighters who have to break into a burning building to save one person? Two lives are at stake in this point. You could have a robot for this. What about uh, people like me who are very bad at cooking and might start fire hazards immediately? We could have assistance in our houses as well. It's a good way to be lazy as well. You can break on these things and probably play a couple of games, enjoy life as it is. Now, let's go forward. When the internet was unleashed upon the world, crazy things started to happen, right? People made blogs, people, uh, we had coders, we had front-end developers, back-end developers, what have you. 
Then we had cat videos, cat memes, all of that. Then we had something called Photoshop. When Photoshop came into the picture, everybody was like, oh no, all the people who used to paint over photos to edit them, they're going to lose their jobs. Everybody, all the newspapers went crazy over this. Then that didn't quite happen. Why? It's because Photoshop allowed you to do more things than it took away. So it's like, I could automate a few things. If I wanted to manually blur an image earlier, uh, before Photoshop existed, I would have to hire a very uh, talented professional. It would be very expensive. or would charge on an hourly basis. And then he would have to paint over your painting. And there would be a lot of errors. Here in Photoshop, it's like, Control Z, undo, done. You can, what it happens is it takes away the repetitive tasks and makes it easier for you. So you can do more things in lesser amount of time. Quality of life. See, 80% of the Americans today are not satisfied with their jobs because they feel that it has repetitive work. What we want AI for is to learn these things and take away the repetitive work so that we can venture into the uncharted territory, as we say. Think of Google Translate. It has, uh, suppose I have Spanish assignment today. Then what happens? I am not good at Spanish, so I'll type a sentence in English and translate it into Spanish. Then the Spanish sentences are not so grammatically accurate, the language isn't good. But based on your knowledge of Spanish, you'll fix the sentences in such a way that this, uh, the sentences make sense. So in this case, I would term, from the Photoshop example, from the Google Translate example, I would term AI as a tool. A tool that helps you perform your tasks better. Why is this? See, think of it this way. We humans are meant for qualitative work. Creativity is our game. We are not about doing 10 times, uh, you know, 10 digit times 10 digit multiplication. That is what uh, that hunk of silicon in my computer case is for. Think about it. A race so superior that it was blessed with neocortex, with so many evolutionary benefits, why are we putting ourselves beneath one silicon atom? Why are we doing that? What I would say, what I would like you to take away from here is AI is just a tool, just like the wheel, just like the internet. It is here to create more jobs. Yeah, they're, they're, change is very difficult to allow, but change is needed in the process of evolution. So let's work together with AI, and may the force be with you. Thank you.